All right. Um, like Patrick kindly did last evening, I want to take advantage of being up on the soapbox and share with you just some Selenium tips that hopefully you'll be able to start using right away, help make your life easier. Um, and I'm going to present, that's borrowing from the title of the official blog, A Smattering of Selenium Tips. And to make this more interesting, I'm going to do it as a poem. Uh, however, talking about Selenium with AB, AB rhyme scheme is not easy, so I apologize for the weak rhymes in advance. All right. Locating elements by XPath is one of the deadly Selenium sins. It is even worse and slower than using Windows ME. But if you need to traverse up and down the DOM, you cannot win. You will have to use XPath, but proceed carefully. What we found works best is to use XPath only one time. Find a useful par parent element and then get or assign it an ID. Use this ID to reference the child nodes without the XPath crime. Your tests will be faster and more maintainable, as you will see. Often we validate the contents of an entire table, which can be a lot. We found that grabbing the contents cell by cell is way too slow. Instead, use JavaScript injection and grab and return the contents in just one shot. Returning a JSON 2D array of table contents is the way to go. JavaScript injection can help in many other situations too like randomly filling in every input on the page as fast as lightning. Users love to break things, so I think this is something you should do. The fact that somebody may be named Robert Drop Table Students is quite frightening. Often you want to know if an element is visible, which makes some sense, but visible, like Nixon, will sometimes just lie to your face. We use JavaScript injection to traverse the style or class attributes of parents, Combined with a regex or two, we determine visibility with grace. Selenium tries its best, but in some cases, like a deer in headlights, it may freeze. To prevent everything from hanging, we run commands in a separate thread. If the join timeout is reached, we log the error and end as we please, allowing our teardown to properly run instead of the whole execution being dead. All right. <laughs> Log everything you can about each run in the database. Inputs, outputs, log statements, and screenshots are what engineers crave. You can always delete information you no longer need when that is the case. But only David Copperfield can produce information you did not save. Speaking of screenshots, they are an engineer's best friend. They are divine. But sending them over the series of tubes can sometimes be quite slow. We found that having your test wait for them to upload is a subpar design. Use a separate thread to upload, and letting your test proceed is the way to go. And that is actually it. I'm early. Thank you. OK, so um, my name's Devin Smith, and this is Matt Perry. And we're from um, Agora Games over in New York, and we're working on a small QA team um, and an agile Ruby-based project. So as a company, um, we're sort of moving more towards web development and web pages and um, obviously have a better need for more web testing. So um, the QA team has changed to support this and we've moved to Selenium. And like everyone else here, we started with the IDE and really quickly kind of uh, ran into some of the same problems with it being brittle, with um, the QA team would get frustrated and they'd kind of backslide into their old uh, their old work habits, do manual testing, whatever they had to do to, to make the, uh, the deadlines. So um, this made it actually really hard for us to get uh, business units and the developers and even our own QA team behind kind of using Selenium and making this switch. So what we wanted was a, uh, an open source tool that really kept with the the spirit of Selenium and made it really easy and accessible for people to um, access more of the deeper parts of Selenium with a wide base of technical background. And some of the things I think we really wanted were uh, version control and uh, test organization, better results, making it easier to like hook up to Sauce Labs and other things we wanted. And um, it also, we wanted it to integrate with, with things we already used um, that our development team already used, like Hudson for continuous integration. So in an effort to accomplish our goals, we developed a small open source Ruby gem 
to uh, leverage some of the power of Source Labs while leaving the test creation as simple as using the IDE. Um, our tool, Gondola, we named it Gondola, uh, while small, uh, does a few things which have really helped us make the transition and sell Selenium to the rest of the company. Uh, for example, uh, Gondola allows for better test organi organization by encouraging a hierarchical structure for your test case storage. Um, Gondola also works best when used in conjunction with version control, Git, Subversion, whatnot. Um, and Gondola also provides more detailed test results after an execution. Um, most importantly, though, Gondola's main feature is that it offers a one command line, um, one line command that for the distribution of your IDE tests straight into Source Labs across browsers that you specify quite easily. Um, and we, we've come to realize that our tool is just one of many tools that everybody builds uh, so they can use Selenium in a way that um, benefits their specific needs in their company based on the company's goals and the company's um, culture. And um, this whole space of tools is what makes Selenium such a spectacular um, tool. However, um, when Patrick gave his keynote yesterday, um, and he um, was explaining the difficulty in moving past the, the clunky IDE. Um, this really struck a chord with us because it seems like we're in that space. Um, and he offered one possible solution, which was a web portal that would allow less technical users to more easily manage your test cases, more easily execute them, more easily find the results and whatnot. And so, this was an idea that Devin and I had been tossing around for a while back, back home, and it really, it was nice to hear someone else be in that boat with us. Um, so we would like to see Gondola move in that direction. And ultimately, we'd like to continue iterating on Gondola and perhaps get some community feedback from those of us who are also in the same area that we are. Um, and we want to provide a unified place for tests so that all users of any level can join in. So I think uh, Gondola has helped us out a lot um, because most importantly, it's gotten members of the QA team and the company excited about making this switch. It's really increased our integration and our dialogue with the dev team. It helps that we're using the same tools and speaking the same language that they are. So um, the quick setup and the ease of use of this tool has sort of kind of greased our conversion no matter what level people on our QA team are at technically. And it has also sort of inspired them to learn more and uh, to really dig into the deeper features of Selenium and prove the return on investment to the rest of our company. And I think that interest that it sparks and the way it helps uh, people really move forward, get into the more advanced stuff like we've been talking about at this conference is sort of the goal of all teams starting out. And uh, I think that's, that's what we're hoping Gondola can help with. Uh, hi, my name is Matt Devor. And um, these are my teammates, Da Jung Shu and Tomohiro Kaizu. And um, uh, our project is the Native uh, Driver, which is a native app UI automation uh, tool with the WebDriver API. Uh, yeah. So, um, So, uh, yes, yeah, so what we're trying to do is we want to supply a UI automation solution for native applications by supplying our own implementation of the WebDriver API, which is slightly extended. Now, the furthest platform along is Android, but other platforms have recently started that we're working on, which is iOS and Windows. So why would we use WebDriver to drive native applications? The name Web is right in the name. So the first reason is that many operations, the WebDriver UI automation atoms, uh, are universal between all UIs. So the item on the left side uh, are, have completely clear and obvious meanings in a native world, and the methods can be reused as is. Second reason is uh, the idea behind the web element find element uh, UI call is universal, and that idea is that the uh, UI is a tree. And this idea is universal between web and native. The web UI is the DOM, the Windows UI is an HWIN tree, and Android UI is something called a, uh, views, a view hierarchy. 
And also, uh, the API is inherently extensible. So without going into the native world, even in web drive, just the web world, uh, there are ex API extensions like Rotatable and Rendered Web Element that are implemented only by a subset of drivers. So we want to supply uh, some simple platform-specific extensions as needed to attach on the API. And this will allow us to avoid uh, creating a new AP API for every platform and emphasize the similarities between all platforms with the core API. And this will also facilitate piecewise code reusage uh, between uh, the same tests written for different platforms. Okay, here's a um, basic overview of Android native driver. Um, just as the normal um, remote web driver test, the server and client are decoupled and communicate through JSON wire protocol. And our server part is added into the um, debug version APK. And interaction is driven by Android instrumentation framework. And the production, the production code of uh, the test target won't be affected. So we are going to show you a demo video on Google Map for Android. Before that, please have a look at this code snippet. It's pretty easy to understand the mapping. We could um, start an activity just like opening a web page using a URL. And we could find a bottom using the ID defined in the XML in Android and perform a click. The um, back key pressing and screen rotation have been already supported in the WebDriver API. We can use send keys to input string for a query. So um, here's the video. I'm sorry. Um, we are trying to verify the click. Um, bottom clicking in both poetry and horizontal UI. And we're trying to search for a station in Tokyo and we're find the result. That's it. So, and lately we started the iPhone native driver to test iPhone applications. iOS 4 has a standard UI automation too, but there's no, so, command line utility to start test automatically. And it depends on its own JavaScript API, so testers must study new automation API. So this is the architecture of iPhone native driver. This is almost same as Android. Since the server part and client part is separated, you can use familiar web driver API and web driver tools. So um, the next steps we want to go for uh, with this project, well, uh, it's used internally right now. Four teams are experimenting using it on their own projects. We also want to outsource it within the next few weeks. We also are exploring ways to drive black box components like OpenGL Surface and user custom views. And we also want to be able to test web content embedded in native applications using, um, using classic web driver semantics so you can write the same test uh, with drive native and web components. <laughs> Hi, uh, my name is Joe Confuso, and I'm from AGFA Healthcare. And for those of you that might not be familiar with AGFA Healthcare, uh, we do radiology imaging solutions. Everything from uh, doing diagnosis, where the radiologist diagnoses a problem with a radiological image, to archiving those image, images and then distributing those images and the results to the physicians that ordered those exams. And where Selenium comes in is in the uh, testing of the app that distributes those results. The app is called Zero, and it's a pure JavaScript uh, viewer. And uh, we use uh, Selenium RC to test it, and we absolutely love it. Um, we write our tests in Java. Uh, we've implemented custom JUnit runners to uh, paralyze our tests over 18 for over 18 uh, browser platforms, uh, similar to what Aaron was talking about this morning. Um, so, you know, we've got like Firefox on iOS, we've got Firefox on XP, IE on Windows 7, those are all different browser platforms. Uh, so we have roughly 2,000 tests, and if you do the math on the 18 platforms, and then you minus some tests that don't run on all the platforms, we run about uh, 25,000 tests a night, which take roughly about uh, three hours, and which we're very happy with, and if it wasn't for IE, we would probably run them in about two hours. 
Um, we've extended the framework in a variety of ways uh, because we do, it's a very sophisticated app. It's uh, sort of like the Google Maps of radiology. So we've added mouse wheel support for doing a zoom to point a la Google Maps. Um, we've added some missing mouse over and mouse out functions over particular points because we have some hover functionality. Um, one thing that we've done is, uh, you know how people, or most of you are capturing screenshots when a test fails. Well, another thing we found very important would be to capture the uh, firebug log, you know, the console log. So when a test fails, we get the, a snippet of the log to better uh, diagnose why the test failed or what's wrong in the app. Um, we've done things like extend the get eval function to return a list of strings except instead of just one whole big string. Um, we've also implemented a get eval file so that, um, you know, we've got a whole bunch of JavaScript utilities for accessing VML and SVG elements. And uh, so that way we can type all our JavaScript in a file and evaluate, evaluate it all at once before the tests start. So this was great. We had all these uh, utilities and we have a bunch more that I haven't listed. We were about to contribute them to open source, and all of a sudden we realized, oh, wait a second, what's this, what's this web driver thing? What's this Selenium 2 thing? And so we thought about maybe holding back, because you know, we weren't sure. Maybe it, uh, you know, this wasn't something that was going to be accepted. So we started looking at web driver a little bit, and we're very, you know, we're very thrilled about it being uh, you know, to capture more the user, how the user works, and as well as it being more performant. Um, however, we've got a lot of work cut out for us to transition over. As you can imagine, it's going to be a tough sell to our management to say things like, yeah, well, we need about, uh, you know, maybe two months to transition from Selenium 1 to Selenium 2, so we're going to be doing less tasks. Oh, and by the way, well, you, know, you know, even if we transition over, well, maybe we don't have Safari support anymore. Or as someone mentioned yesterday, maybe the Google Chrome driver, um, isn't up to snub compared to the other ones. So it's a bit concerning for us. Um, also, uh, a colleague of mine uh, compared Selenium 1 and Selenium 2 sort of to what's going on right now in the mobile world of uh, web apps versus native apps. Uh, and I can kind of see where he's coming from uh, because when you think about it right now, if a new, if a new browser comes out, uh, we can quickly um, test the uh, we can quickly test our, our software on the new browser with Selenium RC with very little difficulty. And, it'll, and, it pro, and it does hash out all of the bigger problems. And also something that I find maybe even a tad ironic is that now we're testing our web, you know, our web programs using some maybe very native components on some of the mobile devices. I just find that a little bit ironic. Um, but nevertheless, we're going to see whether we transition over. If anybody's interested after at some of the stuff we've done to enhance Selenium RC, you can come and find me. Another thing we've done is we have found a way to um, run Selenium RC on things like iPad and Zoom and Playbook. Uh, so if anybody's interested, you can come by and see me. I have a demo. We have a quick and dirty prototype if you'd like to have a look. Hi guys, I'm Anand Ramdev, and uh, on Peter World I'm known as Testing Geek. Okay, and I work in UK as an independent consultant, and one of the advantages of being working as an independent consultant is that you get to work on different teams. And in my experience, because of that I have observed many patterns in different organizations and different teams, and those patterns really help me in improving my testing. So we are all familiar with the design patterns in development, like singleton or factory or lazy initialization. And probably some of, some of you guys have used those patterns. But these patterns are not limited to just your development activities. There are similar patterns in your testing as well. And they are just not for the coding. They are for everything that you, in the entire thing which you call as testing. For example, you can find your pattern in the way you treat automation, the way you approach your automation, you can find pattern in the type of defects that you find. You might find that some people are good at finding usability defect, and some people are good at finding security defect, and some people are not good at finding any type of defect, but they can still contribute in the project. And on the, on the same type, on the same time, uh, there is a pattern on how testing or automation is perceived by the organization. Some people say that, okay, testing is great, and some people say that testing sucks. So there is a pattern in their behavior in how they treat testing. Now, 
most of the time, this pattern matching happens in the background. And we used to call it, we call it as uh, either gut feeling or intuition. We don't think hard to convert this gut feeling or intuition into the pattern. And uh, even I wasn't doing that. And I wasn't even thinking that there is any value. But then I had a conversation with Michael Bolton, not the singer, Michael Bolton from testing community. And uh, he provoked me to think hard and think on the lines of identifying those patterns. And there is a definite benefit from gut feeling and intuition to the pattern. Because when you are talking about pattern, then you can discuss that pattern. You can share that pattern. You can teach other people those patterns. And maybe you can improve those patterns. Now, these kind of things you, can, you just can't do at the, for the gut feeling or intuition. You can't share your intuition. You can't discuss your intuition. And you can't improve your intuition. So it's very important for you to identify work hard, think hard, and identify what is the pattern in the intuition and gut feeling that you have. So, and specifically for the domain that we are working on, web application testing, patterns are even more important because most of the web application testing have similar kind of architectures, similar kind of problems. They are solved in the similar way, and we normally follow the more or less uh, same type of automation framework for, uh, um, for our different web applications. For example, different kind of things that you might want to check for websites are like SEO related checks or the, or the accessibility related checks or the different type of links related checks. There are thousands of different things that are very much similar for all the web applications. So I would just say that think hard and whatever you are doing, see if there is any pattern which you can externalize, and discuss, share, and improve it. Perfect. Hi. Uh, you hear me? My name is Guy. I'm from Answers.com. I'm from the automation team, and uh, well, my, the, in the talk, I'll try and show how we, I'll try and show how we, um, what are designed um, for our scripts. Uh, we use Python instead of Ruby, which everybody here has used. Uh, and uh, okay, so our goal is, as an automation team is to run all our tests, all our test suite, every time the com the, the, the developers may made a commit. Um, and the, we have two uh, hard points here. It has to run in five minutes. And if a test fails, um, we roll back. So we're not there yet. It's, it's still science fiction for us. But we're getting there. So uh, this is what we've done. Uh, how, how we do, how we, how we go on in the, Q, on the QA team, we have manual testers and QA and automa automation testers. Uh, once a feature comes out, uh, the manual testers get it. They test it and write a test plan for us and we write it. So I'm going to go over a test plan and write it as we go along. So what we do is we get a test plan for, uh, we ha we're, I didn't say that, we're a question answer site, we, we're like Wikipedia but with questions and answers. Um, so this test plan, what it does is log in as a, as a user, uh, go to an unanswered question page, answer it, uh, check that the answer is on the page, then uh, check that the answer is stuck, which means go open the question page again and see that the answer is there. So in five minutes, I hope we'll get to one of these. Um, so what, where we start off is the naive approach, which is, uh, as I said, this is Python, which is practically English. Um, so this is probably code you all know. It's the naive approach. Um, it should be pretty straightforward. You log in, uh, which means uh, click on the cor correct places. Uh, I'll just run through it. Find an unanswered question, which is what was better, Python or Ruby. Um, go to the correct place. Answer is, of course, Python. And this is the second, second um, case. So what's wrong with this uh, code is, of course, the code duplication. Uh, if we have another script that runs the same thing, we Use, we use up the same code. So we, how we solve it is similar to the page object um, uh, method everybody shows here. We insert all this into a code, into a, into a library file, and add it into a function. And same as all these parts. How much time do I have? Two minutes, 14, OK. <laughs> so uh, this is what we've done. We have a library file uh, and put all the places, um, all, well, just, just that. We, we see that we use this, this, um, this function twice. We have a question page that's, that it's not actually a, a, a page object, but more of an action and page object uh, library. 
So this part of code has no code duplication, but there's still something wrong. Uh, there's no reason why this code should run uh, concurrently after this code. They, they, should, they can run simultaneously. Plus, we have all types of users, all ty types of kinds of users, and um, we want to run the same test as two kinds of users. So what we do is we insert this into a function, and, uh, and this into a function, and we have, the, we have an admin code which takes care of everything. So we wrap up Selenium in, in a user, um, a user uh, object and uh, go from there. So we have C. OK. So uh, this is uh, just um, the, the admin code. Our interface says that there must be a get tests uh, function, which returns the, the functions which run these tests. OK. Um, one last thing I'll skip to the end is that uh, there's no reporting. What we do about reporting? You want everybody to be able to read this. So what we do is we use um, a Python, uh, Python uh, feature, which is with. What it means is uh, it, it's like a try and accept. In the middle, this, this code runs in a try and accept block. If there's an error, we raise an exception and report the error. And these, and these, um, these uh, messages come up in the report. I'll just show you a quick glance at the report. If you want, come over and I'll show you again. These are all of our runs. And this is a report which is like all green, which is very rare. Um, <laughs> and you can see that this is a mobile run, and it tells you exactly where it is. Hi there. So uh, how many people here use .NET? Wow, wow, lots of people. So um, what I've done, er, or well, actually what our team has done, is uh, uh, my test lead came to me, or actually our dev lead, he came to me and said, I want our tests to run faster. I'm like, well, they're running pretty fast. What I need them to do is run in parallel. And he's like, well, haven't you found anything? And I'm like, okay, I'll look around. So I, I poke around for a few days, and I'm like, you know, there's this thing called MB unit. It sucks. Uh, it, it, you know, we'd have to change frameworks. And he's like, well, and I said, uh, N unit needs a parallel test runner. So he comes back to me the next night or the next day. He, uh, he lives in Poland. So, uh, you know, his, he just worked during his day and uh, came up with a multi threaded test unit for uh, N unit. So, uh, first of all, uh, there's the URL. Uh, for this thing, and I will tweet that out. I guess I made it a little big. Uh, GitHub slash cheeseburger slash mt dash init console. Uh, so your code will run mostly just fine. Um, I did have a problem where I had uh, init was reading some parameters uh, for the browser, and I was kind of storing that in a static variable, and it did not like that at all. So uh, once I had it read the configuration every time, that worked out just fine. But everything else, what it does is every thread ex creates its own, uh, uh, run runs the test, uh, the test setup and the test teardown. And so uh, uh, unless you do some funky things in there, every, everything will just work just great. It, you, all your data will be there. Everything, uh, test setup and test teardown will work just the way it should. So. Um, there were a couple of things uh, that we just added to the code, and I asked him, uh, well, there's some tests I can't run in parallel. So I asked him to add this tag. So uh, all you have to do is uh, add a using statement for our uh, concurrent test runner. It starts with cheeseburger. Um, and uh, then you just add the synchronous test tag, and then that test will run uh, synchronously and not in parallel. And the other thing we did, and you'll see, uh, or the other thing in this code uh, that uh, um, I want to point out, and you'll see why later. Uh, here we have, I, I just, I failed the last test. We failed. Um, so I'm going to go over to the command line where this would run. And um, uh, it's pretty easy. It has all the actual switches of... Uh, This was off the, oh, well, yeah. 
Let's see. Oh, N. All right. Well, we'll do that later. Um, it basically has all the switches as an uh, end unit. Uh, so it's the end unit console runner, except for uh, one, ad two additional things. The first one is uh, this uh, slash depth. That's the degree of, de of uh, how many threads you have. Degree of parallelism. We almost called it warp factor, but yeah, it was already written. So, um, so we added that command line switch, and then I asked him, uh, and this was actually based on a blog article that we saw that somebody had made an, another end unit runner, but then didn't post the code out, so we couldn't use it at all. Uh, so I asked him to add a switch to retest, to rerun failed tests. So uh, we added this retest failures. So that's going to rerun that test that failed. Um, and it's just going to do it automatically. And I actually haven't started using that in our production tests, but um, uh, I'm certainly going to uh, start. So we'll just fire this up. And um, it looks pretty much like end unit. Now, um, these are running synchronously, so it tells you. There's, uh, all the output is being captured and put into the XML answer file. And uh, so if you're looking for things that you might have sent to the screen, it's not going to go to the screen. It's, um, you know, it's being put to the uh, XML file. And if we go to our um, vendor unspecific test running system that we have, uh, you'll notice that uh, this first test, this test A is running under Safari. And uh, so uh, test A is going to run under Safari and Firefox, and then the rest are going to fire up and then you're going to see a bunch of tests running all at once. Um, and I guess that's it. Thank you. All right, thanks. Um, so I'm Scott Sims. I'm from Austin, Texas. I work for homeaway.com. I'll get this mic right in a second. Um, I'm up here to talk about my page object factory called Selenium Fury. And um, let's take, talk about what page objects are. On the screen, you can see we have a page with a lot of check boxes, a lot of different HTML elements. And it takes a while to put those into a page object, but if you did, it would look something like this. This is Ruby. Um, basically, you have uh, nice Ruby names to go with the Selenium IDs. So uh, these are nice. They take a while to, to build. And when I started this, I was working on a page that had 300 checkboxes. And I was like, I'm not, I want to test these. I want to randomize the, the going through this page, but I don't want to have to record all these. So... That's what this uh, tool does. So you take a look here. This is what the test looks like. Um, you run it. If you look at the bottom corner, it's going to go to the page. You give it the page URL. And it uses Selenium to navigate to the page. And then it uses Nokogiri to look for every HTML element. HTML element that's on the page. So now you have this nice Ruby class that's spit out that you can use in your tests. So that's awesome, right? Everybody loves uh, page objects. <clears throat> if I was going to use a page object in a test, it would look like this. It's a little screen. <laughs> Wasn't ready for how little this was. So yeah, so it's cool because they give you auto completion, right? Which is great. So in my situation, the page had 300 checkboxes, and then they were automatically generating IDs. So, oh man, you know, now my test all break. So what am I going to do? So I start manually, up, manually going through, updating all the IDs. So this wasn't a good idea. So uh, the next piece is a validator. And <clears throat> what you do is you pass in your class name. So here I have an event search page, and it uses reflection. It reads all of your locators and uses Selenium uh, browser.element question mark to find all the locators. So let's run that real quick. So in my case, I had 300 different uh, elements on the page. And I updated 10 manually. And then this tool was able to tell me, hey, there's 50 to update. So I trashed the page object, regenerated it, and now my tests are passing again. So. They are all there, so that's great. All right, so that's all good and all. Uh, the only problem is that sometimes the IDs don't make sense. So you, you want to name things by what they are uh, in business terms, right? So like amenity 2.0, you know, equals golf. You know, that, 
you don't want to say browser.click amenity 2.0, you want to say browser.click golf. So um, you have a custom generator that you can set up where you can go on the page, and in this case, you know, you, you have these nice labels to grab. So what you can do is you use uh, Nokogiri and pass in CSS locators of the data that you want to find. So in this situation here, I have a label that's right after an input with the name refinements. So when I run this, it'll actually name things correctly so that I don't have to do it on my own. So, um, let's see. so that's it. Um, so as a consultant, um, I get into lots of conversations where what we actually call things really matters. So um, Selenium is the brand. It is the project name. So when you're saying that you are using Selenium, it means a whole lot of things and nothing really specifically. If you're saying Selenium 1, you are referring to a version of the Selenium project. Selenium 1 has Selenium Core, Selenium IDE, Selenium Remote Control, and Selenium Grid. Selenium 2 is also a version. It has Selenium IDE, the Selenium Server, which has the Remote Control API, the Remote Web Driver API, and as you saw earlier today, new grid capabilities. Um, there's also Selenium Web Driver, which is an API. Why I have that little black bar at the bottom of the screen, I have no idea. Um, so again, remote control and web driver are APIs. And because they are separate APIs, that means that it is a migration between them, not an upgrade. Think in terms of what Mac did with OS 9 to OS 10. There was the Carbon API, and now there's the Cocoa API. Carbon still exists, they just don't really advertise it. This is the same thing. Remote control is not going away yet. So, when you say web, say web driver, when you really mean web driver, don't say Selenium 2, because Selenium 2 is a version and whole, has lots of things in it. And say remote control, if you mean remote control, not Selenium 1, because remote control is in Selenium 2. But in either case, use page objects, as we've been drilling into your head <laughs> over and over and over because it makes the conversion a lot easier, since the future of Selenium really is in the WebDriver API. And we're done in a minute and 55 seconds. OK, okay. so um, when we all test, one of the things that always comes up uh, in pe what people do into CIs is they have this idea that they always want to know what lines of code are being hit by their tests. But if you were to run, um, your Selenium tests, you have no idea what, what uh, you're actually covering and what, you know, what you're doing. So uh, today, well, actually for the last couple of days, I've been coming up with a, an idea, and I just want to throw it out there. So like with um, WebDriver, you can actually find, pinpoint where elements are on, on, the, on the page. So like if we went to um, like the, web, uh, the, the site for the conference, uh, let me find it quickly. And we wanted to say, look at something like wh where one of the links are. Um, uh, we like so with Selenium, uh, with WebDriver, you would just go well, find me that link. Uh, so there goes that idea. Uh, two 
many images. So the, the premise is that because you can find all these things, um, Uh, you can see where where they are, and then you can start potentially generating heat maps. So, like, if we, for this, we just want to know where everything is. Is that we can just go? Well, we we've got the element now, uh, and then we can see its location. And suddenly, from from this, we can start extending the framework to start generating heat maps. And this is the the concept that I've started playing with as an, an as an idea, just a, as a way to extend the framework. Um, and we can also see like the size of the element that we're working with. Uh, and then you can start really generating what, what you want and how you would go about doing it. And if you have a set, like you set a session from the beginning of your, t your test run of over all your tests, you can start um, to generate all these heat maps uh, from start to finish and see where you're testing and what areas you aren't testing at all. That's it. Can I have some of Adam's minutes? <laughs> <laughs> um, hi, I'm Paul Grandjean, um, although that is French. Uh, you can pronounce it Grandjean if you like, but I don't. Um, I um, got involved writing the Selenium documentation. Um, I, I probably most people would, uh, who know about this would consider me, I guess, the lead author because I kind of kicked it off. Um, my role at the moment is probably that of senior or lead editor like at a newspaper because I'm editing everyone else's stuff. Um, what I'd like to talk about here I, um, is something Patrick mentioned yesterday about getting involved and how you might get involved. And I'm not just going to refer to the documentation with respect to that. Um, he mentioned two things. He mentioned the documentation could use some contributions, and yes, that is definitely true. Uh, we could use your help. Um, he also mentioned uh, the need for build engineers. Um, so. Boy, what can I say about that? Um, a funny thing happened to me on my way to my career. <laughs> I was in Prague, 07, had just landed a job at an American company that was building a brand new development team in Prague. They um, had never had a professional QA person. Well, I sort of kind of said I knew something about automation, which was only kind of half true. Um, and promised that I would build them an automation suite. And uh, got this job, and um, also knew I would have to evaluate some tools. Never even heard of Selenium. Um, it was recommended to me by our uh, also brand new on this team developer from Kiev. So Selenium in 07 had already gotten out to the Ukraine. Um, so I went and gave it a try and really liked it. And so for about a year, along with dabbling in, in things that were more related to my immediate job role, um, I ended up using Selenium Core, you know, with the HTML-based runner and um, Selenium IDE. Uh, found its limitations pretty quickly, actually. Um, eventually got the time in our schedule to start trying out Selenium RC. It took me three weeks just to get it working. I was working alone. I was, at this point, the second QA person to work for them, but the first person, the other person was someone who I hired. So I was the expert, and I had no idea what I was doing. Eventually found out you needed to use Star Chrome instead of Star Firefox to actually make Firefox work and not have security certificate problems. And I'm like, um, I guess kind of probably maybe uh, Simon would say this, bloody hell. <laughs> um, Wow, um, and so I thought, geez, these guys need a user's guide. And um, as it just so happens, I used to be a teacher. So I think I can do this. So I dove into it. I'm like, well, what can I do? So I got onto the users list, which I was already semi-active on, and put out a call to see if anyone would, would help me. And I got some amazing people. Sa Santi, sitting down here, who most of you know. Um, a gentleman named uh, Tarun Kumar Banda, who I need to look his last name up again. Um, it's on the Selenium docs. 
uh, who's in Bangalore and unfortunately is not here, and Dave Hunt, who you saw present on Canvas yesterday. Um, the rewards have been immense in terms of helping my career. Okay, this is weird. <laughs> and, um, but the sense of community that we had just on the documentation team was amazing. And I think that's a testament to all of us who worked on it. And I tried to keep it kind of community oriented. Everyone's helping each other out, contributing. And um, I know they got a lot out of it. I got tons out of it. And so now I come to this conference and um, I get to meet Jason and Simon and these other people. And I'm like, my little contribution has given me so much. And I've now got a really good job that I think is going to be a big career mover for me at Overstock.com. I've just been there three, three months so far. So where am I going with this? How am I doing on time here? Oh, okay. So as you can tell, it's a bit of a plug. So um, they can, the Selenium community can use people, and it truly, truly, truly is a supportive community, and that's to the credit of these gentlemen who I've now met for the first time but felt like I've known for three years. Thank you very much. G'day. Oh, sorry about that. Um, yeah, my name's Tim Koopmans. I'm, uh, my Twitter is at 90 knots, and by day I'm a freelance performance tester. And by night I hack around on uh, Ruby and Watergrid, and obviously I'm based in Melbourne, Australia. And you can get all the uh, code that I'm just about to show you uh, at that GitHub location. Has everyone got it? Good. So, what I'm going to do is talk about Watergrid. There's a couple of different uh, resources. It's free. You can get it off RubyGems. Uh, and I did a slide show as well for the water day so you can go get more information. But basically, Watergrid is, uh, funnily enough, distributed testing on a grid network with water test cases. Uh, it's built entirely on top of uh, Ruby core libraries. It doesn't, um, you know, use anything really funky. And basically, um, what can I say? It's uh, built on Rinda, so it uses a lot of Linda type paradigm in terms of distributed computing. So you'll see words like tuples and tuple spaces and stuff like that. But I think a demonstration is in order. It's really simple to use. So you start a controller just like that. Cool. And you start a provider like that. So you can actually call that from your Ruby code, but that's just a command line way of doing it. And obviously, you go and start a provider on all of your uh, remote VMs or EC2 cloud infrastructure, which brings me to my demonstration. That's not good. Wait one. OK, I'm not too sure what happened there, but uh, I had a bit of a browser fade. So let's go back and have a look here. So basically, what's happening now is uh, I've started up 50 instances of uh, Amazon EC2, because that's as many as uh, let me start up. And Watergrid is going off via the controller that's sitting on uh, EC2. And it's obviously sending it uh, a bunch of uh, water commands, or in this case, it's just going to navigate to one site. Um, now, the browsers are shutting down, and it's just sort of outputting uh, what I had in the water code, which is obviously my company website. I just did a mini load test. That's pretty much it. I'm not going to swear, but. Oh, no, I am. Holy shit, you guys finished early. <laughs> That's impressive. We did 12 talks in uh, 55 minutes. I am, I am shocked, utterly shocked. So round of applause to all the lightning talkers.